80 transactions a year, a million dollars in GCI. This is Amber McDonald's production numbers this last year. She's a partner with us at the co-founders group here at EXP, and she's here today in Tacoma, Washington to show us exactly what she's been doing the last few years to build her business to this point. And by the way, these 80 transactions, they're all referrals. A lot of agents don't have access to this kind of training like we do here. This is something that we put on regularly live and broadcasted on Zoom, but I wanted to put this out there so if you wanted to be a part of this, if you wanted to watch live here in Washington or uh, live on Zoom, DM me on Instagram, at Mr. Aaron Yoon. Tell me you want to be a part of this and I can bring you in. But for now, please enjoy Amber McDonald showing us how the fuck she built an 80 plus deal a year referral business, making over a million dollars in GCI. Think about your life where you wake up, you make maybe 20 or 30 lead gen calls that week. You set six appointments, five of those came directly to you, one came from those phone calls. You sign every single one of those because your value proposition is that damn good. And you know that you're going to close most, if not all of those. And that is my exact stats from my week last week. Damn. And that's what we're going to teach you here today. So I'm going to teach you how me and my husband have created a seven-figure business in six years and why my life is sexy as fuck because I wake up and I don't care or worry about where the next piece of my business is going to come from. I wake up and I think, how am I going to bring a good quality product to every single person in my world right now? I wake up and my clients are telling me how much they love me. They're so grateful for us. They say, thank you so much, Rally Point. You guys are amazing. My team, every single day, loves what they do, even on the worst days when we're laying on the floor, because <laughs> it is a hard market right now. When I started and I decided to get my real estate license, I had a passion, um, and I was a transaction coordinator, and um, I had all of the limiting beliefs in the world, you guys. But I knew that I had to start somewhere. I hated being salesy, um, for those of you that don't know. Uh, I never wanted to be a realtor. I did not think I could make it here. Um, and I had all the people in my world that I looked up to actually telling me that too. You're a transaction coordinator, Amber, you can't be a realtor, right? They don't, they don't do real estate and sales. You hate sales, you don't want to be a realtor. Um, I had people tell me that the type of business I wanted to run in the community I wanted to help, I would fail miserably. But I had one person that was so intense in my limiting beliefs. And it was myself. Because what all those people didn't realize is that I was struggling mentally with my own limiting beliefs of, I just had a TBI. I feel stupid. I can't remember what I made for lunch last week. I can't remember half of my life. I don't know anything about houses. I don't have any friends here. I don't have any family here. My husband's in Korea. Um, I have PTSD and depression. I can't be a realtor. I can't build a business with all of this going on, right? I mean, I, I know nothing about houses. I know nothing about Washington. And I failed geography in high school, okay? <laughs> so, uh, but I had a passion, right? And when you have a passion, then you figure it out. And that's why you need to figure out what drives you in life. And so I made one commitment to myself is that when I said yes to something, I would always do it. I would always follow through. And so I put a system around my weakness there. As I said, well, I'm going to say yes before my brain can tell me no, right? And I was a little slow back then, so um, it took a minute. But I would just say, yeah, so you want to go door knocking, Amber? The biggest and scariest salesy activity ever? Yes. And then afterwards, I'm like, door knocking? Why am I going door knocking? But I said that I would do it, right? So, Amber, you want to do open houses? Sure, yes. Within half a second, I didn't even think about it. And I did this for the first three years of my career until I had to start creating balance and say no to some things. Um, and this is everything I did. Um, let me go to the next slide. But I didn't sell out on my values and who I was, right? Even though everybody was like, you've got to get salesy, you have to be salesy. I was like, well, that's not what I feel like I need to do. And so I figured out a strategic way around that. So I figured out how to sell without selling. Um, and you guys will have all of this too in a script um, uh, Google Drive that will share a QR code with you. Um, and so I learned how to sell without selling. Um, and here's a few of the tips. Now, those of you that are already in co-founders and those of you that are not in co-founders yet, our whole industry gives you scripts every single day, right? You have so many scripts. So you're going to get some scripts from me today, yes, and at the end you'll have all of them editable. 
But I want to show you guys the technical side of it, and not techie, because I'm not a techie person, but the technical and strategy around those scripts, because you can practice your scripts all day long, but if you don't really know what to do after that, you're kind of like a fish out of water, right? You're like, great, I'm doing the exact script Amber said, why isn't it working for me? So I want to teach you guys what to do with that while giving you a few scripts. Is that okay with you guys? Yeah. yeah. All right. If you're told you're being shocked, respond with this. So without reading it, which you probably can't because it's so small, but what do you guys think and what have you done in the past when somebody says they're shopping you? Don't be scared. I'm going to cut you. <laughs> I feel like you just kind of like close heart. You know, that's the response, right? Like, yes. Should I, you, oh, should I better step on my closing game? Yes, close hard, sign them right then and there, right? That's not what I do. And why I don't do that is because I know that that's what most of my competition does. They're going to pressure them to sign right then and there, right? So I'm going to do the opposite of that because if you're shopping me, I already know what most agents are doing. They're going to pressure, right? And so instead I say, that's amazing that you were taking the time to interview multiple agents. This is a huge decision and one of the most important sales or purchases you'll ever make in your life. And it's imperative that you have the right team backing you. And then I book a consultation, right? Why do you think that I say it that way? Exactly, right there. What's your name? Paige. Paige, yes. I don't need to close you because I'm the best. Mm -hmm. That's right. Because I am the best. Because I practice everything I do so much. And because when I thought all of those limiting beliefs, what I did was I took that and I stayed up till 2 o'clock in the morning practicing. Practiced on my dog because I had no friends, right? And so I know that I'm the best. And then I took all of these other agent scripts that they gave me. I took different consultations and I morphed it into what I felt good about. I was strategic with it, so yeah, I'm not going to pressure you because I know that I'm, I'm also going to probably try to be the last one that you interview, so then that way you just sign with me and I can share with you all the things that they did wrong, right? So practice and know that you guys are the best because when you're putting in the work, you don't have to question yourself and that confidence, even if you're brand new, even if you don't feel like you're the best, act like you're the best because that's going to that's gonna do something for you. Also, what I'm saying in there is I'm telling them how important this is, right? Because I'm not a discounted agent, and so I'm gonna tell you how important this purchase is in your life, and I'm teeing myself up for my consultation. So making sure that they know that this is one of the most important financial decisions that they'll ever make. Number two is your consultation. Bring value. Educate them on the stats and facts, not just yourself. So you guys um, have probably seen a lot of different people's consultations, I have morphed my consultation out of multiple different people's consultations, but then what I do is I bring the actual facts and stats, I call out the elephant in the room, I talk to my client during that consultation about all of the things I hear, about the fears, the objections that we hear in Breakfast Club, I've taken those objections and I don't wait for them, right? I tell them what those objections are because they're going to trust you more. Who in here has a consultation? You should write that down if you didn't raise your hand as one of your nuggets. Have a consultation. I promise you it's going to make your life a lot easier. Number three, don't change what you say, how you change how you say it. So instead of, can I help you? Can I come over and do a consultation with you? Can I do a walkthrough of your house? Can I send you my questionnaire? I'm happy to help. Always come from contribution in everything you're doing and see how the difference is in that conversation. And so you can take any script that you have and then you just morph it to that contribution mindset. And then would it be helpful or valuable if I sent you over my questionnaire so I'm able to get a better look into your goals in specific situations? So one thing that I see a lot of agents do in this market is they blanket the market. Oh, it's a crappy market. You can totally get a deal if you're a buyer, right? But not always. I've seen multiple offers on my listings in this market, right? Um, if you're a seller well, you're gonna always pay closing costs. You might definitely set that expectation, but you don't know for sure. So make sure that you're not blanketing it and then telling your client, I know that you're not just like any other client that I've ever worked with. I want to know your specific situation. That shows them that you care about them and that's what they want because they have every other agent just thinking about their paycheck, right? But you're going to come there and you're going to tell them I care about you. I want to know about your situation and what are your goals, right? 
and then actually care. Um, and then my questionnaire, you guys will have that at the end, um, and it's a blanketed version. I love having a questionnaire, and I did not make this up, I took it from another agent, uh, because it's a starting uh, point for every conversation I have. So that's how I kind of get going through my roadmap of when I'm converting a lead, is I start with, I'm happy to send you over my questionnaire so I can get a, a look at your specific situation, what's your email address? Oh, thank you. Okay, here you go, right? I'm not asking them to sign with me, and I'm also treating that entire conversation not like it's a transaction, so I'm not having to ask them all of those informational pieces that I have on my questionnaire. I'm simply there to create rapport, create a relationship, and make them love me. That's my whole goal with that conversation, and then book an appointment, obviously. But because they love me, they're like, yes, I'd love to meet with you. Thank you so much, Amber, because you're coming from contribution. So the questionnaire kind of takes the grossness out of it, but still gets you what you need, because this is a business and it is a transaction, right? But they don't feel like they're a transaction. Okay, so when I did my master class, I had a ton of people ask me about my door knocking scripts. So you guys will get a bunch of those at the end. We've uploaded some of them, but um, we'll continue uploading them over the next two days. So definitely keep a lookout for that Google Drive. But again, you can have a million scripts, but if you don't know what you're doing, you just throw those scripts in the garbage, right? And so I want to give you guys some technical pieces of it. So how to prepare for door knocking. Has anybody in here door knocked ever? Nice. Does anybody like door knocking? Okay, all right. I'm gonna change, I love sometimes. <laughs> so door knocking was actually my niche, which is weird because I hated being salesy, right? And so number one location, be intentional. Who do you want to work with? And then implement or put yourself in there, right? Um, what type of clientele do you want? I used to go, because I love first time home buyers, I used to go to the one star rated uh, apartment buildings. Uh, which I don't think you're allowed to do that, so I was like hiding from security guards. But I mean, what are they gonna do, arrest me? Right? They didn't arrest me. So don't do anything illegal, but that's what I did. I got creative. So don't do what everybody else is doing. Do it, but do it a little bit better, right? And so that's what I did, but find where you want to be and then door knock that area. And then when they answer the door, break the ice. So my first time I door knocked, I walked up and I was like, why? And I stood there with my little notepad, and the guy answered the door, and he was so mean, and so just like grumpy at life. And I was like, hi, do you like living here? And he was like, I don't want anything you're selling. And I was like, okay, bye. And I literally just walked away, and I died inside. And I went into my car, and I cried for a second. And I called one of my mentors, and I was like, I don't feel like I can do this. And he was like, well... Why not? And I was like, what if I get shot, right? I gave him all of the, literally asked him that. I gave him all the excuses. I was like, well, I can't do it. I'm not salesy. Okay, then practice more. And I was like, well, what if somebody tries to shoot me? I'm just like coming to their doorstep. That's how much I was like, I'm going to make all the excuses. I don't want to do this. Why did I say yes? And he said, well, if you get shot, I mean, if you're not dead, go to the next door. <laughs> and that is what he taught me. Uh, and it kind of reminds me of Chad Cooley a little bit. <laughs> And that's why I love chat so much, because I have my people in my world who, like, I want to hear my excuses, and then I have my people like Chad who's like, I don't care. <laughs> Suck it up. Right? So, I, after I stopped crying in my car, it was like 30 second cry sesh, right? I said, okay, well, how do I get around this? I'm strategic. I'm a transaction coordinator by nature. How do I put a system around this, right? And I said, okay, well, they think I'm selling them. So I'm gonna tell them I'm not selling them, right? So as soon as they open the door, I say, I'm not trying to sell you anything, I promise. And then I'm laughing while I'm doing it. Don't say, I'm not trying to sell you anything, I promise, because then it's weird. But, um, and then that just breaks the ice, right? And I'm like, okay, well then, what are you doing here, right? And so then don't sell them, and I'm gonna teach you how not to do that. Number three, your attire, dress for where you're going to. If you're going to a first time home buyer area, like a one star reviewed apartment building, don't come in a suit and tie, right? So know who you're talking to and then dress accordingly. And then number four, bring an att attractive and intentional flyer and bring value. I never sell anybody when I'm door knocking. And you can also do this when you're calling too. And so what I do is I said, okay, well, I don't want to be salesy, so I'm going to bring them value. Everything that I've ever learned has come from contribution. And so I'm going to bring them value, and I'm going to market a class. And you can market any type of class you want, first-time homebuyer, which everybody does. You can also do a, what's the market doing right now? 
how do you prep your listing for sale? Nobody does those types of classes, right? Get creative. Somebody wants to be at those classes. And then what you do, I'm sorry. Then what you do is you're going to partner with your lender, MK, in the back. And you're going to have him then make that class. You're going to maybe bring the food, right? He's going to get the venue, do whatever he does, and then he's going to teach all of those people why they want to buy or sell. So you're just there, and you're like the cool person in the background at the end that's going to answer all their questions. They're going to fall in love with you. And why I say that is because the goal is not to sign them right then and there at the door, which I know is the opposite of what a lot of people say. And the goal when you're marketing a class is not to sign them on the phone either. You just want attendance. That's your goal. I want to get you to my class, and then MK's going to do everything that he does best, and then you're going to fall in love with me and him, and then now you want to buy or sell a house, right? And the great thing about that is you're not going to have those cold leads that really don't care, and they're just saying yes to you because they're a people pleaser and they are scared to say no, and then you're calling them and then they ghost you and it's just a waste of time. You're going to get the real people that want to buy or sell, but maybe they just don't know how. Right? And that's the type of leads you want. That's the type of leads I get. I get hot leads. Not all the time, but I'd say about 80% of what we do, it's all hot leads, and I know that I'm going to convert them and sell them at some point. Um, and then, let's see, make sure I got everything there. Yes, and then uh, make sure to get their info. And um, I used to door knock a couple, say a couple days out of the week, not very often, and I would always come with at least five to 10 leads, and then I would pack my classes. So I was the one realtor that wasn't waiting for my lender to pack classes, I packed the classes because I didn't wanna just show up, I wanted to already create that rapport, right? And so um, I would bring between 35 and 40 people to my classes. On a bad day, I'd bring five, and I was sad about myself until one of my mentors said, you have five people there, and you got all five of their contacts, and they're gonna buy or sell with you one day, right? And so think about it like that. That's a good question. So I'm going to go into my past follow-up whole dynamic, or dynamic um, but I'll put that in the Google Drive because it's kind of intricate, so it'll take a while. Um, but I do, I'm old school. I have a whiteboard in my office. Anybody that I have not signed yet that I need to make sure I'm talking to and seeing every single day, I have in a whiteboard. And then I have my CRM. And so I have a follow-up A, follow-up B, follow-up C, and follow-up D. And then I categorize them on how hot they are. Um, and even if they're not hot because I already signed them and maybe I'm not going to list them for six months, then I'll put them on a follow-up C, right? And then I know I'm going to reach out to them once a month. And then what I do is I time walk my calendar and I say, today I'm doing follow-up A's. Tomorrow I'm going to do follow-up B's. And then, and then I do follow-up A's three times a week to four times a week. And then follow-up B's I do once a week. Follow-up C's every three weeks. And then follow up D's like once every month and a half. I think it's on my calendar. But I'll give you guys that if that would be beneficial. So the next video, uh, my husband Ryan, that hot guy over there, uh, he's not just my arm candy. Um, he's the brains and the creativity of everything we do. And so a couple months ago, our team, because we are growing right now, was like, I don't know what to say to these people. I don't want to call them. I feel weird, right? And so he showed us this video, and I want you guys to think of this when you're following up with your leads, when you're following up with your past clients, when you're door knocking, when you're calling, everything. Think of this video, and it'll change your whole life. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Russell, and I am a wilderness explorer in Tribe 54, Sweat Lodge 12. Are you in need of any assistance today, sir? No. I could help you cross the street. No. I could help you cross your yard. No. I could help you cross your porch. No. Well, I gotta help you cross something. Uh, no, I'm really fine. So, so. 
so real for what we do, right? And, and those of us on The Breakfast Club, you already know how to not take no for an answer. But if you think about it, well, what if they don't want to sell right now? Okay, well, you want to do something, right? Do you need a landscaper? Do you need a babysitter? <laughs> what can I help you with? And if you do anything before you make those calls or knock those doors, just say, okay, I'm going to help a bunch of people today. And I promise you, those people are going to trust you. They're going to like you. And whether they're selling now or they're selling in three years, they're going to sell with you, right? So help them whether it's now or later. Now, we're going to go back to that door knocking class, right? I'm marketing my class. Well, I'm moving out of state. I'm moving to Colorado. I don't need to come to your class. Oh my gosh, it's totally okay. That's exciting. Are you excited to move to Colorado? Yeah, I'm really excited. I hate it here. It rains all the time. It's terrible. I don't know if it rains in Colorado, but. Um, and then you build that rapport with them. And then you say, you know what? I'm more than happy to still have you still come. No pressure to buy or sell. And if you're not buying here or selling here in Washington, well, you can sell here in Washington. But if you're not buying here in Washington, still come, get educated. That way you're one step ahead of when you buy in Colorado. And then what does that mean? What can I do now in Colorado? Outside referrals. A lot of our business is outside referrals where we partner with our uh, agents and, and we refer. And then they love you because they're like, man, you don't care that I don't want to buy here, so don't let me come to your class. Yes. They're like, I love you, Amber. I'm like, I love you too. And then we're friends forever. And now they're not only going to be an outside referral, they're now going to be a referral partner here in Washington for you because they have friends, right? And so number two is, I can't buy right now. <clears throat> Ask the questions. Don't be scared to get personal with these guys. You're the professional. Ask them. No worries. Why do you think that you can't buy right now? Well, my credit shop. Oh, awesome. Top 1% lender, MK Bruce, is going to be there teaching, and he's going to tell you guys how to build that roadmap so when you can buy, you're good for it. Do you guys want to come get educated? Oh yeah, really? I, I don't think I can buy for like a year. No worries, you don't have to buy right now. Nobody's gonna pressure you there. Then make sure your lender is not a pressury lender because then it's weird, right? The whole theme of today is don't make it weird. Um, and then you get them there and then you introduce them to MK and then MK is going to create a roadmap for them on how to get their credit better. And then in six months to a year, sometimes it's a lot sooner than that because they think they can't buy, they're gonna come to you because you're gonna have a really good follow-up system, right? And you're gonna keep in front of them. Just bought my current home here. They have friends, so those that just bought, they have friends that are really jealous of them. So invite their friends to your class and figure out who would benefit. And those people that just bought, they like to brag about themselves a lot. So they're gonna to wanna to brag about themselves, right? And have them come to your class. And then I already have an agent. Well, have you signed a binding contract with that agent? And yes, I'm that person, because if they have it, then it's free game. If they haven't and they're wowed by them and they love them, I don't poach like that. But if they haven't signed a binding contract, I get them in front of myself for a consult. And I say, you know what, don't wait for the class. Why don't we do a one-on-one -on -one home buying class next week? And then let's see if maybe we would be a good fit for you. And all of these scripts, because I'm not, I'm not Randy, I'm not good script on the fly, um, all of these scripts will be in that Google Drive, just so you guys know. And then rates are too high. So one thing that I've seen a lot of people do, um, Ryan's actually seen a lot of people do as well at some of his events, is when they say rates are too high or if they say something that's you know correct or incorrect, whatever it is, that professional wants to just kind of show their own ego and show how great they are and they just kind of stomp on them right there and just like go in for the kill, right? So when you're doing this, just get them to the class. MK is going to tell them why they should buy right now. Right? You might want to sprinkle a little bit of knowledge there, but you don't want to hinder or, I guess, offend their ego because then they're not going to want to work with you. Right? And so I say, you know, I know there's a lot of unknowns right now, but this could have equipped you so you were fully prepared for whenever rates do come back down so you aren't missing the mark before all of the prices go back up and the frenzy starts. You can totally still come. Nobody's going to pressure you to buy right now. Would that be helpful? Yeah. Nobody's going to pressure me. I say that so many times a day. Nobody's going to pressure me. Why? Because agents pressure you. And so I go against that. Um, and then they're going to come and then they're going to probably buy right then or whenever they buy, they're going to buy with you. So you have to start thinking what you want out of your career. 
And that's that rat race, right? We just think about when do I get my next paycheck? When do I get my next paycheck? But start thinking, what do you want out of your career? And there is no too big. There's going to be people in your life that create those limiting beliefs like, can you actually do that, right? I have people in my life that are like, huh, don't be sad if you don't get there. And I'm like, and I don't even get offended anymore. I just say, you know, your world's a little smaller than mine, right? My world's a lot bigger because I think bigger. Because I don't care how big the goal is, I'm going to get it if I commit to it, right? Yes. And so... What do you want out of your career if you are planning to be in the rat race for the rest of your career, which is fine. If you love to make those calls every single day and that's what you enjoy, then that's not a bad thing. But that's when you're going to think just the short game. So that's when you're only thinking about door knocking, cold calling, expires, all of those. Number two is going to be planning a business. So that's your one to five years down the road, right? But if you're trying to build a motherfucking legacy, number one, stop planning and thinking and start taking action right now. And if you guys haven't read the 10X Rule Book, buy it on Amazon like right now. I read that book first week of being licensed and it changed my entire mindset. Has anybody read that book in here? So good, right? I love it. 10X Rule Book, sorry. All right, so you need an action plan, right? So again, your short term, the grind, that's where we're at. I'm a really good grinder. My first year in real estate, I sold 35 homes because I, I grinded it out. That's what everybody's doing, right? You cold call, you door knock, you do everything. But I didn't want to do that forever. I'm tired. <laughs> and I was pregnant. <laughs> I got pregnant after a year and a half of getting my license. So I knew I didn't want to be in that forever because I didn't like salesy. And even though I wasn't feeling salesy, I just didn't enjoy that day-to-day -day life. So one to three years out, that's going to be your recent past clients. So anybody that's closed in the last couple months, stay in contact with them, right? Credit repair people, not buying or selling for a year in your cold leads. What you don't want to do, you guys, is you don't want to plant the seed by calling all the people you're calling and then wait for somebody like me to pick your flower when they're ready. And that's what you're doing. I've had so many people definitely in the last 12 months call me and they're like, hey, this person called me, told me I should buy. My friend told me that I should come to you, so can we do a consultation? And that is a regular thing that happens. So plant the seed and then get strategic. Use my follow-up plan that I'll upload and stay in front of them. And then long-term, that's all your past clients. Now that's when, again, you don't have to work harder. You just have to work smarter and you have to be strategic and put systems in place. So that's keeping in touch with all of your past clients, which we'll go through here today. That's your events, which I'm like the event queen. And again, I'm just the one that was like, let's do parties. It's Ryan that actually puts all the creative spin on everything we do. And then um, your current clients and your active transactions. Now this is something that I hear a lot where it's like, well, and I got told this as a brand new agent, you have the transaction, leave it. You're already getting that paycheck, right? You're already getting paid for that, go to the next one. And I see people going like this and it makes my soul so happy because you should not do that. That's your future referral. That is your one transaction that's gonna turn into 10, 20, 30. I have some clients that have referred me more than 40 pieces of business in my career. Even when they don't live here anymore. So this is the ecosystem of our business. And I want you guys to know so you don't get overwhelmed. You do not have to do all of the little white circles. You can, but take a picture of this and really just plug and play what makes you happy. Because when you're happy doing something, you're going to excel at it, right? You don't have to do all of those things, but that is everything that we do. And we're very systematic with it. Now, the inner circle, you have to do all of those. You have to be good when you're in front of the lead. You have to give a good quality product and you have to exceed expectations if you want a referral-based system or business. And why that is is because, again, that's your referrals and you can either be the villain in their story or you can be the superhero. And the superhero, they're going to go, they're little billboards for us. Literally, I have a million little people, 450 people going out and just lead jetting for me every single day while I'm here. Yesterday, we got three leads in, all referrals. And I was practicing for today and I wasn't even in it, and that's the business model, right? And it's all of our transactions, and that's where they start. Now, you can also be the villain if you're terrible, if you bail when it gets hard, right? If 
you don't care if you have that commission breath, now they're gonna go tell all of their friends how crappy you are during the transaction, and then their friends are gonna call me, and they're gonna say, hey Amber, Kathy told me that their agent sucks. They didn't even have a consulate, and they do not care about them. They're trying to push them into this house that they don't want, and I told them that they need to talk to you, and my answer to that is, well, did they sign a buyer representation agreement? And then they say, no, can you believe that? And then I say, and then I say, awesome, I'm more than happy to help them. I'm so sorry they're going through that. Do you want me to reach out to them to make sure they get directly with me and not somebody with my team? Yeah, Percy, this is why you're so great. Yes. Okay, awesome. I'm going to call them right then, and then now I'm going to go sell them that house. That has happened more times in my career than I can think of. Don't be the villain in their story, because they will fire you. And even if they don't fire you, they're going to tell everybody why they shouldn't use you. Right? So be the superhero. And it's more fun when people tell you how great you are every day. <laughs> All right, so how to create raving fans. That's what you want, right? And now it seems hard, but really all you have to do is cater to the business in front of you and be systematic. Now, don't stop lead genning. Is Chad Cooley hear me on there? Don't stop lead genning. Don't stop calling. You can't just do the transaction. And that's why people will tell you, don't care about the transaction once it's under because you already have that piece of business. This is where you have to make sure that you're strategic. So you still lead gen, you're still in the grind, right? You still have to be there until you create a business like this. Um, but you want to make sure that they are on your daily to-do list and they should be first. First people I talk to is either my transaction coordination team or my transactions if there's a fire. First people I talk to. It's 30 minutes on my day and the rest of the day I'm doing lead gen or business building. Doesn't take that long, but I make sure my people that trust me and that I told to trust me aren't gonna now go feel like I don't care, right? So you must give a good quality product. You must be there giving them top level service during their transaction, over communicate. I know a lot of you guys didn't um, come to my, uh, my mastery class, but I talked about how communication is a huge deficit in our industry with lenders, with realtors, with Ask with everybody. I mean, just communicate. Stop thinking that they know. Stop assuming that they know. Because even if you've told them, they only hear 20% of what you say. And then when you have those conversations, reiterate it in a writing, either in email or in text form. My team knows anything that we do on the phone, we reiterate in writing. Why that is because I do not want to get sued. I've never been sued and I don't plan to get sued. But I'm ready if I do, but I'm not going to get sued ever because I always make sure that I cover my ass. So even if that's the only reason why you're going to take that extra step, do it. But really, when it comes back to it, we do have certain clients that they're like, well, Amber never told me this. I'm really upset. And I nicely screenshot and I say, hey, I know that there's been a lot going on. I know that this is a really exciting time. I just want to make sure you saw, like, I did say that. It's totally okay. Now they're mad at themselves a little bit, but they're not mad at me, right? I'm not going to lose a referral because I forgot to reiterate in writing. Because at the end of the day, I'm not going to argue with them if I didn't do my job and reiterate in writing. I'm just going to eat it and be like, okay, here we are. How do I fix this, right? And then have their back. So when everything gets tough, don't leave. The only times I spend more than 30 minutes on my transactions is if there is a huge fire. Um, and that's what we call in our office, like everything's going to crap, right? Everything else, my TCs have my back, um, but if there's a fire, I'm right there and I'm making sure that they have my expertise to fix it and I have their back until it's fixed. And then understand all parts of the business, not your part. So MK said something to me the other day that I love. Understand enough about the lending process to be dangerous. So you don't just want to be that person that opens doors, right, and pushes paperwork, because that's what people think of us as realtors. You want to be part of that change, and it takes time, right? It took me years. But every time you have an opportunity to learn, ask the question why. And if you're asking that question why, and the person on the other phone makes you feel stupid, fire them and go get another partner, because you're with the wrong person. Um, I ask all the questions. My team knows. When I hire them, please, dear God, ask a million questions. I will never be mad at you. I will be so proud that you are coming to me rather than pretending that you know. So MK is going to teach us a little bit about that. Follow up and follow through process. Do you trust that your hard-earned clients will get the same attention and care for that you would provide? So this is huge, right? Uh, we were talking about a lot of uh, agents right now 
This is your paycheck, right? So it's, it, yes, it's, it's your client, it's your paycheck, it's your livelihood. There's so many things wrapped into one, right? So, you know, you guys have these hard-earned leads, like are they being followed up with? Are we making sure that we turn over every stone to get to the, uh, make sure these people get taken care of and they're getting pre-approved, okay? So that's another thing to follow up with. And then process, is there a clear process that's duplicatable and repeatable every single time, okay? So I know that, you know, one thing that, that Ryan and Amber do, they're, they're very, very good on, they have a group text, which I love. There's also an email with everything broken down, so there's no miscommunication, right? Um, when we're working files, here's a big thing. Does your partner know that we need this type of finance, and let's just say it's VA, they have no money in the bank, we have to get a seller credit, all of these things. How many have worked a transaction, didn't know that from the lender, you guys just wrote up a contract uh, over asking, didn't know you needed a seller credit. How many have been there? I raise a hand, right? It's a terrible, terrible, terrible feeling, right? When you're under contract and the buyer's like, I don't have that money, right? So there's clear communication. So oftentimes we'll write, yes, pre-approved that 450,000, we'll need uh, $12,000 in closing costs, or let's make sure that we're working up that exact uh, house that you're looking at so we know exactly is there points involved, are we doing a buy down, whatever it is. But if there's clear communication, it's easy, right? We worked on so many different things. Manufactured homes, we ran into the manufactured homes, right? Got to get a little creative. Is it lease land? Things like this. Has the manufactured home been moved? These are questions that we're working with our lending partner. If you don't have that in your relationship, then that's when you got the little uh oh, right? Amber wrote in there that um, you need to know enough to be dangerous, right? Oftentimes, when we're sitting down, we're going over numbers. If we're going over numbers, I want to be that guy, right? If we're talking about a contract, I'm pushing it back to the agent. That's not my lane, right? We never want to get to a point where you're like, oh yeah, that should only be about $2,500 a month. And then you say that, and then they come to me and it's like, oh yeah, you know, Matt said it's only $2,500 a month. I was like, no, it's not, <laughs> right? <laughs> the hell it is, <laughs> right? <laughs> So we want to make sure we have that clear communication. So Amber's going to come up. I'm going to ask her a couple questions. So, so one thing, right? So we're just going to do just, just a couple questions. So let's just say, so you do a lot of listings, right? Now, yeah. Yes. So heavy listings, right? So here's where I want, you know, who's mostly buyer side? Anybody out here? Mostly buyer side? So buyer's agents out there. Um, so let's just say um, you're listing your, uh, a property, right? Let's say 450000 It's competitive, right? I come in and I'm uh, offer $10,000 over asking, I need 10,000 back, right? Mm -hmm. And we know that that's still an asking price, right? Mm -hmm. um, what's the value in that? Like, to give, me, give me, what are you looking for when you're writing up that contract, when you're looking at the contract? Let's say you have one that's conventional, $10,000 under, right? I'm a VA buyer, I'm 10,000 over asking for 10, but we're at asking price. What are you thinking about? Accepting an offer, going through your, uh, with yourself. Do you mean like about the credit or about the lender? What are you thinking about like, the whole process? Are you looking at who the lender is? Are you looking at the total net profit? Yeah, 100%. First, I look at who the lender is because a lender can make or break the entire transaction. Lenders, I tell my clients that because they drop me on ego. I'm number two, but that lender can make or break it. So if it's somebody that I know is terrible, um, we'll counter and we'll pull the lender. Um, very not in a mean way so I don't piss off the other agent that we, we have tapped with it. But lender number one and two, um, I mean, does the closing costs that are wrapped in, it's wrapped in, you said, right? Yep. Is there comps for that? So am I gonna deal with a really bad situation with an appraisal? And if I am not 100% certain, which I am never 100% certain because appraisers can do whatever they want, I'll always set expectation on that if we decide to accept that. Because I've, I've heard some, some listing agents say, okay, I'm going to take this conventional deal, it's $10,000, $5,000 less, uh, but they're not asking for any credit. Is that something that comes up for you? Yeah, and again, it comes back to the comps, because if, if it's wrapping it into full price offer rather than a conventional that's underpriced, um, if there's ample comps for it and I know that I can meet a Tidewater, then I'm going to pick the, the higher net because but I also know a lot about VA, so I know that it's actually one of the easiest and best loans to work with. Okay. And then as far as, and that's a great segue into this, uh, a lot of listing agents that are out there say they don't typically like VA, why is that? Because they're misinformed. What's that? And they're uneducated. Because we hear, we hear it quite a bit. So, you know, I have a lot of VA buyers, they go and they put an offer, and listing agents say, oh, well, it's VA, right? You hear that quite a bit, but 
in your experience, what do you, what do you experience from VA buyers versus conventional and FHA? Yeah, so 97% of our business is all VA. So we, I know it, I know it like the back of my hand. And what I find that I educate my buyers on the VA loan, uh, the exact same amount that I educate other listing agents. And again, I have tact with it. Um, I'm not one of those egotistical people that are like, you're dumb because you don't know. <laughs> I, I say that they're uneducated because they're truly uneducated. A lot of the ones that I run into are people that have been in the business for a long time, 20 plus years, because back in the day, the VA guideline was actually really tough to work with. Yeah. So they're worried about the appraisal. Um, usually, they say that the buyer isn't as strong because they don't have a down payment, that they don't actually know what's in that buyer's bank account. If you're not going to have to put a down payment and it doesn't really serve you, why would you put one down? Um, and the appraisal, yes, there's more stipulations. So it's, if it's a rehab situation or if it's situations where I have listing agents that they're like, Amber, they can't do anything. Um, they're not going to you know, fix the chipping paint. I've painted before. Um, and I will do that if it's just chipping paint. Done. <laughs> yeah. Um, but if it's other than that, I just educate them on, they're actually not harder, and if the comps are there, the comps are there, and I've actually had a lot of um, low conventional appraisals and FHA since this shift, and the thing about those is it is what it is, you can't fight it. With VA, you have the opportunity to prove the price with a Tidewater, and a Tidewater is not a low appraisal. So if I can teach you guys anything, a Tidewater doesn't mean it came in low. It means that they don't see the justification for the price and the value. And so you have 48 hours as the agent to prove that price. And don't just assume the listing agent's going to because they might think that now it's just low, right? So help them. Um, and I've actually beaten a ton of Tidewaters where they come in not value. So. Which is huge. So, that's the biggest thing. so the biggest thing that we want to make sure is like when you guys see VA deals, these should, these are absolutely the best loan product in my opinion. So, uh, how many knew that you can pay off debt with seller credit with VA? Not everybody uh, knew that, but you know we had a client that we're working with. Um, actually, uh, AJ, we have one uh, right now that they need to pay off a car. They only have about five thousand dollars left on their car, but it gets rid of a four hundred dollar payment. So, with seller credit. We can have the seller can pay that car off and get rid of that that uh, liability. Everybody know that. Hey, so we're gonna talk about all these things. You need to make sure when you're sitting down with your lender, like, okay, what can we do, right? Don't tell me what we can't do. What can we do, right? So we sit down and go through that. So she had a, she had a, a buyer a buyer that was uh, declined and couldn't buy, and now we have a way, right? So it's still a lower amount. Like we're gonna find something for them, but there, there wasn't a way before because you know previous lenders didn't. Make Right. Um, one one last thing, um, I kind of want to go through too. So you're talking about the relationship going back and forth. Um, are you going to go through the handoff? Because I think that's the biggest the biggest thing as far as the handoff. The Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's all I have. Okay. All right, get out of here. Right. Thanks, guys. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I uh, know. So ten percent, yeah. So you put you put ten percent now, you go up to six percent okay. credit, not five percent, six percent back. I back. That's not my problem. <laughs> yeah, but, but also with VA, you can go technically you can go up to six percent on VA uh, and FHA as well. Good question. Okay, so I have most of my clients work with my partner lender. Okay, um, but I don't take any liability, right? Because we don't want to pressure them. Um, into working with our lender. Um, and so I have a script for you guys. Again, it'll be on that Google Drive, um, but I'm gonna take you through it. And so on my roadmap, I've sent them the questionnaire, right? And I'll have a roadmap on my Google Drive too. Send them the questionnaire, we're building rapport, right? And I wanna know if they're pre-approved. That's next, are you pre-approved? But I don't wanna come out and say, so you pre-approved? Because if not, I'm gonna work with you. Because that's what they hear, even if you say, so are you pre-approved without saying anything else, right? I'm gonna add a little bit of fluff to it. Um, so I say, so have you been pre-approved with a reputable loan officer who has allowed you to get that first step of your pre-approval started, or would it be helpful if I connected you with our partner lender? Why do you think that I say it that way? There's a couple things. And then go get a lender for breakfast. Yeah. Online lenders, aren't they fun? Yeah. 
couple things. So I'm finding out if they're pre-approved, number one, but I'm saying it a lot nicer because I'm bringing value with that question, not just asking, right? Um, and then number two, I'm putting it in their head that they should be wowed. That's the response I usually get. Well, I have one, but I, I mean, I wouldn't say I'm wowed. And even if they say, yeah, I have one, I'm good. My next question is, awesome, what's their name? And usually they're like, ooh, uh, I don't know. And if they say that, even if they say, yes, I'm good, then I know in my consultation, bring it back up, we're gonna bring them over to MK because they don't even know their name and they will know MK's name when they talk to them, right? Um, and then number three is I'm letting them know that I do have a connection if needed, so I'm creating that value, like I said. Um, and then so the buyer says, well, I have someone, but I wouldn't say I'm wild by them. And then I say, all right, awesome. Have you have they fully pre-approved you yet, or are you just getting started? I'm gonna ask that again because even if they say that they have somebody, I don't know if they're pre-approved, and I'm trying to dig to see what their motivation is because if they're pre-approved already, I'm like, cool. You want to meet? I'm like, how? Can we come to your house, right? But if they're still working on that, then I know, okay, you got your motivation. We're gonna kind of do this dance a little bit. If they're shopping me, I'm gonna sit with them right then. But if they're not shopping me, I'm probably gonna let them go through the motion so I don't overwhelm them with all of my side of the consultation, and I'm gonna let them figure that out first. But I am going to schedule it, and I'm usually gonna schedule it for about four days after I talk to them. That way it gives them four days to get with MK. It gives them that urgency, so they're not gonna be like, I don't to give them all of my documents, right? Because I'm going to tell them, okay, we're going to go through your finances during this consultation. I don't want to overwhelm you. Let's get you over with MK. Have you do that first step, which I say, so they know that's the first step. Um, and then we'll meet and go through the fun stuff, right? Bad cop, good cop, sorry. Um, <laughs> and then no matter what they say there, it doesn't matter if they're pre-approved or not. Um, my answer is awesome. Well, I will work with whoever you feel most comfortable with. I say that no matter what. Even if they don't have a lender, I will work with whoever you feel most comfortable with because I'm not going to take the liability or have them feel like I'm pushing them into this. But if you would like to shop around to ensure you're not only getting the best rate but also the best experience, now would be the time to do it. The great thing about shopping lenders is that if you do it, Within a 30-day period of your credit being checked, it will not hit your credit like it does when you buy a car and they run your credit through like a million different companies. Isn't that so annoying? And then they're like, yes, that is so annoying. I didn't know that. So again, knowing enough to be dangerous, right? I know enough about lending to know how to tee up MK. Um, I'm happy to go ahead and send you over an introduction to MK Bruce, who is one of the top lenders in the nation. Would that be helpful to you? Yes. Thank you so much, Amber. You're awesome. And I'm like, thanks. <laughs> thanks. So now, why do you guys think I do an email introduction rather than just being like, here's MK's number? Yes, Paige. And everybody. Really, everybody. Uh, but it's not their job to follow up. I'm bringing value, right? I'm not just a paper pusher. I'm not just here to open doors for you. I'm a professional and I'm gonna bring value to you. And if you guys haven't known me very long, which you haven't, uh, once you do, you'll know that I'm a little bit of a control freak. So I wanna have control, thank you, over the situation. And what I'm a control freak about is my client's experience. And MK can attest to how much I'm a control freak about their experience. But it works, you guys. And so what I do then is I take that email, right? I ask them for their email. I say, I'm going to go ahead and send over my questionnaire, and I'm going to send an email introduction over to MK. Now, what I put in my email introduction is I put the very basic phone numbers, if they're here, when they're trying to look, just a little bit, right, um, of information. But then I call MK before I send the email, right before I send the email, and I give them a full rundown on their personalities. Personalities is my superpower. Psychology is my superpower. And so I can tell usually who I'm dealing with and what personality trait they have within about three minutes. And so I tell my lenders that, and some, before I got with MK, would think that was so annoying because they didn't see the value in it. MK loves it, and I love that about you. Um, and then what I'm doing is I'm teeing up MK for, well, they're first timers, they're really scared, or they've done this like 15 times, right? So MK's not gonna call them, try to take them through a whole rundown that they don't really need to hear. And so that's gonna tee him up, which then is gonna tee up your client to have a good experience, and what happens when your client has a good experience? They love me, right? They love MK too, but I get the referrals and I give them to MK. I don't ask my lenders for leads. 
And I know that that's weird because I know a lot of realtors are like, well, my lender doesn't give me leads. I love if MK gives us leads. I love it. I'm not going to say I don't want those. But my number one priority with who I partner with is are you giving a good experience to my clients? Because in my business model, that's going to get me leads. I'm not going to rely on anybody else to give me leads. Right? And, but I am going to rely on him to give a good product. So make sure you have a good lender in your corner. I would say the biggest thing about that, guys, the, the warm handoff, it just it makes the process so seamless, right? Because the borrowers, they know, like, and trust you, right? So if you are endorsing and saying, hey, they're a uh, direct reflection of me, they're a part of my team, that makes that easy. There's not a fight, right? So, you know, uh, what's that? We just did it yesterday. So, so you guys sent over, you guys' this questionnaire, by the way, is Amazing. So, it, how many pages is it? A couple pages? Probably, I think like two and a half. But the, the cool thing was they sent, they sent, I've never had anybody do this, but they sent the questionnaire that they sit down and do the consultation with the client with. And it was like their hobbies. It was like, you know, how they want to be communicated with. That. And, and all of that. So like when I was talking to this guy, like I was already prepared and, and I knew everything, you know, he's coming over here, he's gonna be a reservist, where we're going, like all these things. And he's like, he wants a text first so he knows where the number's coming from, which I thought was awesome that I wasn't just bombarding him and calling him and, and it wasn't like an awkward, like, you want, you want my social security number? Like what's happening here, <laughs> right? And so um, I was prepared to not have to fight or have that back and forth. Well, Which it seems great. like a lot up front. I get that a lot about our business model. Man, Amber, you do so much up front. But you know what I don't do after that? Chase it. I don't chase it. And I don't really do a lot other than, like, have them love me more. And, <laughs> and bond with them and make friends. So if you do this up front, then you don't have to worry about it. How many hours, if you don't know off the top of your head, think about that tonight. How many hours have you spent because a lender messed up your transaction? How many hours have you spent because you didn't have the conversations up front and your clients pissed? How many deals have you lost because of that? So if you do it all up front, right, and you do the consultation, you do the handoff, and you're strategic with this, and you do our business model, my days are fine. I mean, during the day, all I worry about, again, is like, do we have any fires? Do we have any issues? In the world that we're living in right now, so many people don't care, so we are dealing with more issues. But all we're doing is now creating more systems around how to be more in control. So you have more time. So we have more time. They tell you guys I have two toddlers at home? We'll get to that later. <laughs> well, how do you do that? <laughs> Little humans? <laughs> All right, guys. So the second half, we're going to talk about social media, events, and then follow-up. Okay? So getting started with social media. Now, if you're here and you're looking at me and you're like, okay, Amber, how do I get 365 million followers on Instagram? You're in the wrong room, so you guys can sneak out if you want to. I won't be offended. I am not that person, but what I've done with social media, uh, and if there is that person in the room, please come find me, because we are trying to evolve, and we want that, but what I've done with social media is I was utilizing social media for my business uh, and my follow-up for my past client before it was cool. So this is one of the things in the beginning where I had people laughing at me, literally, telling me that I could never build a business through social media, which I think is really funny today, knowing where it all uh, went to. But what I do is I utilize my social media to keep in contact with my biggest fans, which are my clients. And so my whole business model is how do I stay in front of my past clients? And when you have as many past clients as we have, it does get a lot harder, right? If you only have 5, 20, 30, that's perfect. But utilize this model now and put these things into place now because before you know it, when you do start to implement this model, you're gonna have all of these clients coming to you, and if you don't plan for that and put those things into place today, then you're gonna be like a crazy person running around with your head chopped off, right? And I know that because I was that person. I didn't believe in myself enough to realize that I would have that many clients coming in until it was too late. So when you're on social media, be real, but know that you're on. You guys don't have to be perfect. You don't have to make sure that you say all the right things and, oh my God, I said this weird thing, I'm not gonna post it, post it. People wanna know that you're imperfect. People wanna know that you're a real person, but also know that you're on and all your clientele is watching you. So be a little, a little cognizant of what you say, right? Um, don't only talk about real estate. Please, dear God, stop only talking about real estate on your pages. Check who's watching your story. So I have gotten um, fully transparent here. I've gotten pretty lax with what I post. 
um, which we're working on implementing better systems now. Uh, but I post a lot of my story because if I don't have the time in my day to post on my actual feed, then I'm going to always post on my story at least five to six times per week. Um, and so when you do that, what I love about the actual story rather than the posting on your wall is you can see who's watching you. Because I mean, a, a million people could be watching you, but you only get four likes, right? And you're like, I know you saw this. Why aren't you just hitting the like button, right? So I love watching who's watching my story because then I can connect with them. If they're watching you, and you can use this with Asian attraction too, but if they're watching you with your um, with your clientele, they either like you for the most part, right? Or they're thinking about buying or selling and they're looking at your page because they're like, oh, I wonder if she's gonna give me a market update. So then you wanna connect with them both in real life and then also on social media. So I look to see who my main followers are that are watching and then every single day I comment on 10 to 15 different people's pages. And not just like a cool or a heart, I do a full sentence, hey, that's so awesome, so gorgeous, love that you guys went to Hawaii, let's go grab lunch. And you do that to 10 to 15 people, and it does two things. So number one, people like when you comment on their stuff, right? They feel really good about themselves, you make them feel valued, which is the whole thing about my business model. But then, and also with the algorithms, we'll have more people now see your stuff that you post, right? So if you don't do it every single day, at least before you do any posts on your wall, go comment on 10 to 20 people's uh, different pages. And then that's gonna get you more traction on your actual posts. And then I say, don't only talk about real estate, and what I always get from people is, well then what do I talk about, right? <laughs> all I know is real estate, it's not all you know, right? That's all you think that you should be posting about. So what I want you guys to do is write down five topics that you're passionate about. Write that down right now. And if you can't think of five right off the bat, um, just do that as an activity later. But number one is always gonna be real estate, right? Usually family, two, or a pet, if you don't have kids. And then for me, I'm very passionate about women empowerment, I'm very passionate about mental health as well. And then my kids take up like half of my social media. <laughs> and then be consistent and calendar your activities. And now this isn't just for social media. Who uses their calendar in this room religiously? Nice. 100% of the time. Nice. 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 <laughs> so even if you don't use it 100%, I use mine about 85%. My, my calendar is my Bible, but there's times where I'm just busy and I'm running and I'm going, and my brain is not anymore that TC brain because I have been in this side of our world for far too long, so I'm just running, right? I'm like a racehorse. And so there are times where I have to check myself. So just know that if you're not using it 100% of the time, that's okay. Check yourself when you realize, oh, I forgot something. Um, but also calendar your social media. How many times have you guys realized you went on social media and two hours went by? <laughs> I know there's more yeses yeah. in there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, me too. Me too, right? So if you calendar it, I give myself 30 to 35 minutes a day on social media and then I do not look at it again. As much as I can, I'm not perfect, but that's what my goal is, right? Yeah, and then you calendar it, um, and then that's part of your lead gen, is social media. You wanna get in front of your clients, and if you're not adding your clients on your Facebook and Instagram, you're missing the mark. Add them. And if you feel weird about that, I ask them in my consultation, hey, are you guys on social media? One person of them is like, no, and I'm like, oh. Yeah, I wouldn't be either. I didn't have a business around it, right? It's awkward. But for the most part, they're like, yeah, I am. Would it be okay if I added you? Oh, yeah, that'd be fine, right? So ask them so you don't you know, feel weird. And if you are feeling weird, just ask the question. Call it the elephant in the room. And then add them. Um, and then, let's see. Sorry, I thought I had the clicker. So events. Events are my favorite thing. Um, and really, you guys, you can create that rapport and that ongoing rapport with your clients and, and focus on the clients you want to be around, right? Don't invite the clients that you're like, I did not like working with that person. This is going to be the ones you're passionate about, but this is another touch 
But what you don't want is you don't want them to feel like the only reason you're inviting them is so they give you referrals. There's a lot of times where I feel or I see realtors that they ask for them to bring referrals to the event. I'm not attacking you. Don't yell at me if that's you. It's not a horrible thing, but what happens is now you're not genuine. They know the only reason they're there is so you can get another referral. But the goal with events is so they feel valued, right? I never ask for a referral from my clients during one of our events. I do it so they know that I value them and I make it all about them. I don't make our events around what I want, I make it around what my clientele wants. And I don't even do it, Ryan makes up all that cool stuff. So what we did was we figured out, okay, this is our clientele, which our clientele is all different types of demographics. Um, and so it's hard because I'm like, how do I make everybody happy, right? But we just got strategic and we said, what's the majority of what they'll like? And then we're gonna implement that. So this is, Three events that you can implement now because the other objection that I get for events is, I don't have any money. I don't have money for an event. Have you seen the economy? Have you seen the shifted market? I don't even know how I'm going to pay my bills next month. I'm not going to do an event, right? And so when I started and I got my real estate license, first thing I started to implement was events and I kind of fell into it because I didn't have friends here. So I was like, well, how do you meet friends? I'm gonna have a barbecue or a game night, right? I don't have friends, I feel like a loser. So let me invite people to my house and do a game night. Now what I didn't tell you earlier is Ryan and I were in an extreme amount of debt when I got my license, which made this all a lot scarier. So we were in close to $100,000 worth of credit card debt alone not including our vehicles. We had very little financial education. And then I was like, oh yeah, babe, sorry. I know I got approved into the nursing program, but I'm gonna quit, I'm gonna go be a real estate agent, right? Um, and so I knew that I needed to do something. So with the grind, I wanted to get creative, and that's when I did the game night. And so you can save money by having everybody bring a dish, and what that's gonna do is that's gonna make them feel more part of your world and that you're not just doing this to get another sale. So it makes them feel like they're part of your family. So it's actually a positive thing. And then ask everybody how their house is, bring value, and do what you say you're gonna do. Now, you have to be prepared for somebody to be like, I don't like my house, and this happened, and complain, but be prepared for that. Drop your ego and help them. Come from contribution. You do not have to take liability by just coming from contribution and helping them. Something broke, awesome, I have this contractor that's really great, he gives really cheap prices and he owes me a favor, let me call him, and I'm so sorry that happened. And then I'm gonna look at their inspection if it's something that they weren't aware of, and guess who I'm calling if it wasn't in their inspection? I'm calling my inspector, and I'm saying you better fix this. And he's gonna fix it, because he knows how I am with my clients, and then we're gonna make it right for that client. Because I'm not just here to push paper, and I know that if they're in my home, they're telling me this, they actually like me, but they're not very happy with what happened, so let me figure out how I can make you happy, right? Then we went on to the neighborhood crawl, um, and this is the best way that you guys can farm your neighborhood. Ryan came up with this too. Uh, <laughs> um, and it's not that expensive, so we spent about $500 each, um, and if you don't have a neighborhood, and you're in like, uh, well you can do it with a condo, you can just get a little a bit creative, but if you're not in a neighborhood, just know, you can make friends or go to one of your friends' neighborhoods and then have them be a host. So what you need to do is you need to, um, one, have fun, and then you also, um, from there, need to go to, I'm gonna scroll here, so I'm gonna go back to my notes. Um, you need to go and on the Facebook group and you need to find four to six posts. So you're gonna make a cute little flyer on Canva. Don't spend a million years on it, spend like 10 minutes on it. Make it cute, make it themed. And then you're gonna find your neighborhood Facebook group. If there isn't a neighborhood Facebook group, you just hit the jackpot, because now you're gonna create one. And you're gonna be that person that created the neighborhood Facebook group. But if there is one, you post that on there. You ask for four to six hosts. Our theme is usually back to school, right? And then you find those hosts and you're gonna connect with them. You're gonna add them on social media. See how now it's kind of all working together, right? We don't come branded to the neighborhood crawl. Um, and why we don't come branded is because again, we don't want them to think that we're only doing this to get their business, but they're on my Facebook. And what's on my Facebook? 
all the sales I'm doing, right? So I don't need to tell you, hey, I'm a realtor. Just so you know, I'm gonna put my tent up with my rally point sign. So we're, we do not ever come uh, branded with this. And then you're gonna connect with those four to six hosts. Now, if nobody comes to your crawl or maybe only two or three people, you just made four to six relationships and they love you and those are the fun ones anyways because they wanna be a part of it, right? But then once you get the host, you're gonna see what date works for them. You're going to then draw out a map, it's very easy, and you wanna make sure every host is in the right spot so you can walk to each house together. And then everybody's gonna come, we usually have what, like 30 to 40 people come, each one? We only did this twice, actually, and before we moved out of the neighborhood. Uh, I still get calls asking if we're gonna do it again. Um, and so we have about 30 to 40 people come, and you always wanna be the first host. Why do you think I wanna be the first host? First impression. First impression, and I'm a control freak, remember that? So, <laughs> so I wanna control how that first impression goes, and I wanna make sure that no matter what the other hosts do, I know mine's gonna be super cute, right? And I'm gonna have one appetizer, and this is what everybody does, one appetizer or one meal or whatever you do, and then one cocktail, one mocktail. And so I'm gonna go all out with my decor, we're gonna either be in the garage or we're gonna be on the porch, and then I also know that I'm not gonna leave anybody behind, and that's why I wanna be the first house. So we're probably gonna stay there for about 30 minutes rather than the normal 20. And then if anybody that has RSVP, isn't there, I'm gonna text them, because I got their number because I was very intentional with how I did this, right? I got all their numbers, so that way I can make sure that they got all the information. Um, and then we're gonna go to the next one, and the next one, and usually by like three or four, for all the drinkers out there, you're usually pretty toasty, and it's like a whole thing, and now your neighbors are watching this really fun event, and now they wanna come next year. What we started doing um, on the second one is we made sure the last house was the most fun, family, because the host that host usually want to host every year. Um, so the last house, you usually stay there, and then that's when you build that rapport. Now, what comes up in just normal conversation when you're meeting new people? What question usually comes up? What do you do? So again, that's why I don't have to tell them, I'm a real estate agent. Oh, you want to sell your house right now? Even when they say, hey, we're looking to sell our house, I don't say, will you sign with me right now? Can I list it? I'm very passive, but I'm very intentional. And I'm gonna be that person's best friend, right? Now from there, we spent about $1,000, and on the rough end, um, we made $7,000, or $70,000 in return. I'm about to list my sixth house next week for this community. I moved out of that community two years ago. Friendsgiving. Has anybody here heard about our Friendsgiving? So much fun. This was my idea, okay? Ryan just made it cool. Um, so our clientele is military, and so this is why we did Friendsgiving. You don't have to do Friendsgiving. You have to see who you want to serve and then do something that matters to them um, and think outside of the box. So for us, we know that our clientele, a lot of them can't go home for Thanksgiving, so they don't have a lot of people here. A lot of them will go home for Christmas block leave, right? And so we were like, okay, well, and where this started was when Ryan and I were a very young couple, and we didn't get to go home very many times. We had Thanksgiving once at Golden Corral, that was fun. And so after the Golden Corral like depression of my life, I said, well, I want to create something where all of these single soldiers can come if they don't have family. So our house has always, and still this day, if there's any stragglers that don't have any on Thanksgiving, they know our door is always open. And so we wanted to create something in the beginning of November for all of them. And for us, we had to think really strategically because everybody's different. So at our Friendsgiving, it started very small. It's now one of our most expensive um, events. But why we can do that is every time we get a lead from there, we put money into this event because we know we're getting it um, from either there or another referral and we're gonna put money towards it, right? So as it grew, we started saving more and it got bigger because people like us and we're fun. Um, and so they would come and now we're already having clients ask us, are you doing Friendsgiving? Year. I'm like, yes, you guys, I'm doing it to give it a second, right? And they look forward to it, and it brings them within their community. So we have beer pong championship there. We have football um, on six different TVs, I think. Eight different TVs because a lot of people won't come because it's on Sunday if football's not playing. Um, we have cornhole championship. We have a full spread of Thanksgiving uh, dinner. We have bouncy houses for the kids. We had axe throwing one night, and then we just have us. 
and we just have fun with our people. We have music playing, we do giveaways, it's a whole fun time. And I never ask anybody for a referral, and I have never left one of these events without two leads. So it organically happens, and it doesn't just happen because we do Friendsgiving. So that's why I can't tell you how much revenue we've made, because I can't tell you, oh, I got this lead because we did Friendsgiving. It could have came from social media, it could have come from our follow-up plan, it could have come from just our quality. I can't pinpoint that, but when you do these all together, it organically just comes to you. Okay, so like I said, I promised that I will send my lead follow-up um, structure by Friday onto the Google Drive, so you guys will have that, but this is our past client follow-up. And now, again, I don't want you guys to put this on your calendar and then stop lead genning. You have to lead gen. You have to balance it out, you have to be in the grind still until you don't have to anymore. Personally, I never cold call, I do not do door knocking, I don't do open houses, I don't do anything, and it's not because I'm not, I'm too good for it. It's because I don't have to right now. Now my team does. Reese, one of our newest agents, just got her license a couple years ago, she's out door knocking already, in the rain, she doesn't care, she's out there. Ryan's cold calling all the time. I don't need to do that right now, but they do it, and one day they know they're not going to have to do it. But if it gets slower, and if I don't have the amount of appointments that I need, guess what I'm going to go do? Door knock. Hell yeah, I'm going to go door knock. Because you're never too good to do those activities. I don't care if you're a millionaire. I don't care if you're a billionaire. You are never too good to do those activities. You know what I did do three months ago? I cleaned the toilet <laughs> for my client. It was not my poop. And I cleaned it because I don't care, and that's what I'm going to do for my client, right? <laughs> Take a picture of this. You'll have it on a Google Drive as well. And for those IDs out there that raise their hand, this looks like a headache, right? You're like, I'm not doing that. That's terrible. That's exactly how I felt when I learned this in a class. I hated it. I was like, this is terrible. I can't do it. My brain doesn't work that way, and it's going to take me way too much time. It took me 30 minutes, 30 minutes of acne. I hated it. But now, all year, it's plug and play. And I'm set up and I know I'm not gonna miss anything. So take the 30 minutes and set yourself up. So number one, you're gonna carve out one to two hours per week, depending on how big your past client list is. But if you wanna just make it plug and play, do the two hours. And if you don't need that whole two hours, work on your events, work on your social media, work on something else that caters to your past clients. And then you're gonna place on your calendar each week as an all week task, PCFU and then the letter combo, I'm not saying FU. Um, it's past client follow-up. Now this is how I did it because it worked with my brain better. I actually changed this for how I learned it. So do whatever you need, but what matters is this last combination. Now those combinations are put in place to where you will, it'll occur every 13 weeks and by the end of the year you'll follow up personally with each of your clients at least four times per year and that's on the phone, we call that. And then you're going to time block when you do plan to have that. So I have this as an all week just in case, because I move around my calendar sometimes, don't yell at me. Um, but I, I do that, and then every Sunday what I do is I set up my week. Um, but I do all of my lead gen, my follow-up, all of that before noon. Um, and that's been really helpful for me. So have your time of day when you do it, and just know that you need to have this time block, you need to have your actual lead gen time block, and you need to have your active transactions and your active lead time block. Those are three time blocks you should separate to make sure that you're balancing it all out. Does anybody have questions? We're going to do Q&A at the end, but any, does this make sense? What's the script that you use for following up? I'm so glad you asked, Jason. What's <laughs> that next? Okay, Shanda, you just do those three again? You said you time block active lead gen. Active lead gen, your transactions, and your past client follow up. Now you can have more, like obviously I have my social media, things like that, but those are three time blocks that you don't have, you have to have. Um, and that's, if you do nothing else, that will help your clients on your referral base. Say it one more time. Active, I don't know I had a TBI. What did I say? <laughs> Lead gen, transactions, transactions past client follow-up. At least you have an excuse. Thanks, I know, right? <laughs> So then next, um, value you can bring during your follow-up. Now if you guys want full-blown scripts on this, Ryan and I will add these to that Google Drive. Um, 
but if we go to the next one, so this is the starter of your calls because a lot of the questions we get in Ryan and Reese, they're calling my past client list now. Um, and why they're doing mine is because they both know exactly how I talk to my people. We don't let just anybody call our past clients. Um, so I would never have just an ISA call my past clients. Um, that, that's for lead genning if you want to do that. But um, what I did was I created value to start with. And so number one, you can, Ryan does this every day and it's genius. I'm updating our database and we're calling all of our most valued clients like yourself to ensure we have all the right information for you. And we say most valued clients because why? How do you guys think? We want to feel important. We want to feel important, you guys. Number two, and we're going to go into a little bit more depth on that here in a second. So number two, we have an event coming up and wanted to invite you to see if you and your family would like to come out for a few hours. So that's your barbecue. That's your Friendsgiving. That's your, what else do we do? Game nights. Meet your neighbor mixers. Meet your neighbor mixers we do now. So we go to different areas and we make it kid friendly and we invite just that area of people. Um, number three, if you, for all of your people that you've closed within the last 30 or 90 days post closing, how are you guys settling in? Do you need any recommendations? Remember, you need a dog sitter. What can I help you with? Right? I got to help you with something. And then events in your area. So if you don't know what to say to these people, because you're like, I went through all of them, Amber. I don't know what to say to these people now, and I can't repeat myself because then I'm not genuine then you research something cool in their neighborhood, and then you call them and you say, hey, I just saw this concert in the park is happening next week in your neighborhood. It just made me think about you. I just want to make sure that you have this information. You're bringing value to them. They feel important, and it's not weird, right? I think I said this like 30 times. Don't make it weird. Also, don't be a robot. Don't be scared. You've already worked with these people. The only time you should be scared about calling your past clients is if you gave a really crappy product. And honestly, if you did and you're thinking in your head like, oh, I do not want to call those people, just call it loss and we'll just start fresh from today, right? <laughs> uh, but be genuine and once you get past that first um, step, just make small talk. Find a way to get engaged with them. Figure something out. If you were on their social media, we stop people's Facebooks before we call them. Hey, I just saw you went to Hawaii. How was that? How are the kids? They're getting so big. Just make it very organic and genuine. And then make sure you have a pen and paper next to you. This is going to be your biggest failure with your past client follow-up and your events because you need to make sure that you follow through with what you say you're going to do. And every person that you call when you're thinking from contribution, you're going to have a list for yourself. So if you start to get a bigger list once you start to have longer past client lists, because you're going to, because you're going to be a referral-based business now, you want to make sure that you then put on your calendar a time block for executing all of those things or utilize your team if you have one. And if you don't have one and you start to feel that ceiling, now it's time to start hiring, right? But always do what you say you're going to do and don't trust your brain to just do it because you'll forget. Go for no. Has anybody ever heard this saying before? Nice. So go for no is this is when you're asking for referrals. Now you're going to ask your, your clientele for referrals two times. Number one in your consultation. I have it at the very end of my consultation and I say, hey, also we're a 100% referral based business. If I'm wowing you, because if I'm not wowing you, why are you going to send me business, right? If I'm wowing you every step of the way, I would love to work with your friends and family too. And that's my script. And that will be in that drive as well. So that's going to be your first time you ask for the referrals. You're planting that seed that you're a referral-based business and that you want to work with your friends and family. And then when you're doing your past client follow-up. So when you're not asking for business, is that events, right? When you're doing your client appreciation parties, but here's where you can. You want to document this in your CRM. You want to say, on this date, I did a go for no. That way, 13 weeks down the road, you're not going to do the same go for no. Right? Now they think you're only calling them to ask them for business. I usually do go for no's with each past client twice uh, a year. So two out of the four times I talk to them. But then when I see them at all my other things, they know I don't ask for that. So the go for no script, which will have this as well, is I also want to make sure to let you know that I'm building a home buyer and home seller class. Even if you don't have it scheduled, you'll make one if you have people coming, right? You're not going to just be like, just kidding, I'm not going to do that. So you don't have to have it scheduled, just ask for it. Um, to help educate more buyers and sellers in the area about the current market and the process. 
We're wanting to save seeds for all of our people in our world before we're putting it out to the public. Who, not do you know anybody, who do you know that would find something like that valuable? So you're going for the no, right? You're in your head, you're like, well, they're probably gonna say no, right? But if I don't ask, what are they, what, what's the answer? No. Definitely no. So they might say yes, but what they also will definitely do is get off the phone and be like, man, Amber told me about this cool concert. She keeps in touch with me. She's so awesome. You know, now that I think about it, Ben actually has been saying that they want to buy a house. I'm gonna, I'm gonna connect that now. And that might take a week, that might take two weeks, that might take six months, but they will. So always go for no. This is for MK. Okay, truth time. I watched WWF before it was WWE, and I was an Uber nerd, so. And I had a big crush on Stone Cold Steve Austin. Sorry, babe. Yeah! That's the bottom line. I love Andre Jones. Yes! So, now you're going to get all of this business to me, and you're going to have an influx of business. Now, Ryan, my husband, he was active duty for 10 years. And he has had his license for four years, but he has only fully been in it on the lead gen side for about a year. And it just clicked for him. It's been less than a year of him going all in on our entire business model, and it just clicked for him. He has more leads coming in right now than I do, and it's all referral based. And so you're going to get that influx coming in. My first year in real estate, this is not to brag, but it's to show you the, the length of what this takes. My first year when I was in the grind, I sold 35 homes, like I said. My second year, I sold 50 homes. So then it started to get more, and I was still in the grind, but not as much, because I started to get that referral base coming in. My third year, I sold 74 homes, and since then I sell, on average, even in this market, between 75 and 85 homes per year, personally. That's me, right now. And so, Whoa. be prepared, thanks. So be prepared for that influx to come in, and it's still a lead gen, but you're gonna have these referrals coming in, you have to be ready for it. And so if you lower the value of customer service once they start to come in because you're so busy, right? You're gonna lose that momentum, and now you're gonna be right back in the grind. And once you stop making those calls every day, you don't wanna make those calls every day. Cooley has to yell at me. One week I didn't have any leads coming in and I didn't have any appointments, I'm like, oh, I hate this. And I'm like, I just don't have any leads coming in. And he's like, okay, go door knock. And I'm like, yeah, but and he's like, go door knock. And he tell me three times. And I'm like, okay, right? And that happens once a year usually. We have like this slight lull. And so it sucks when you're in that, when you've been out of it. Even somebody like me that I'm a grinder, I know what I have to do, but when you don't have to do it for a very long time and you, you lead gen another way, it's hard to go back to that. So be smart and be ready for that when that comes in so you don't now lose everything that you just worked for. So how do I do it all without actually doing it all? So we're gonna talk about delegation here. And so you have to delegate. You have to delegate, you have to understand when it's time to delegate. If you start dropping balls or if you start feeling that pressure, it's time. And you don't wanna hire and you don't wanna outsource out of pain. Um, I am living, breathing example of that because I did that for a long time. Um, and so delegation is huge. Uh, we can go to the next one. And how you wanna delegate, um, is really it's a feel forward. I'm not gonna sit up here and lie to you and, and say that hiring is so easy and you're not gonna feel pain, you are. No matter what anybody tells you, you're gonna feel that pain. But what I can tell you is you have to learn from that pain. You have to drop your ego and learn from the pain as a leader on where you can do things better, right? Two years ago, we cleaned house on my team. And it was really hard for us. That was 10 days postpartum and I went full time back to work. Um, out, out of the blue, we had no idea, and when we found that there was cancer on my team, we acted very fast, we cleaned house, um, and then we rebuilt. But I had the decision to make to say, well, one, I hate drama, because it gives me anxiety. Um, do I want to keep doing this? Do I want to have a team? I don't know, and I had conversations with some of my um, most trusted peers, and I said, I don't know if I want to have a team anymore. I think I just kind of want to do this by myself and have a transaction coordinator and call it a day. 
So I was at a crossroads and I decided when I left my brokerage and came to co-founders, I decided that I was going to try again. And, but what I told myself is I was gonna learn from every mistake I had. Now I can sit there and I can blame the cancer that I've had in my team, or I can look in the mirror and see, okay, yes, we had this unfortunate person in our team that created that cancer, but what did I do wrong? And that's where I started. Because if you can't say that, that's your ego, right? No matter what situation you're in, you could have done something better, for the most part, 99% of the time. So these are some tips. Um, Know what you're good at and know what you're not good at, first and foremost, before you start to hire. You don't have to be good at everything. I am not a techie person. Jason knows that about me. Um, you know who is a techie person? Megan Berry on my team. She's not a people person either. She's only here because I was like, I'm not going to do this unless you're in the building. She is the smartest tech person that I know. She is our compliance queen. She is so good at what she does. And I know I'm not. She laughs at me all the time, because she's like, Amber, why are you doing that? I'm like, I'm not good at this, I don't know, help me. She came into my office two weeks ago, and we've been really busy with just building and different things. And I had been locked out of my computer for two hours. I was panicking, I couldn't even get into it. And I'm like, trying to figure it out. I'm like, I got this, Amber. You were a TC, just go into that brain, figure it out, right? She comes into my office and she was like, what are you doing? Why do you feel so stressed? I'm like, well, I haven't been able to get into my computer. I have to do this offer. I have to do this other thing. She clicked two buttons and got me in. And then literally said, why did you even try, right? And it's not to say don't try, but it's to say when you're at a level like that and once you start to get busy like that, know what you're good at and know what you're not good at and don't apologize for it because you don't have to be good at everything, right? And then stop trying to do everything and start doing what you love. What do you love to do? And know that that's going to change over time. Two years ago, I said that I would never stop showing houses. I said I love to show houses. I love showing houses. I also said I love my consultation. I'm never going to give that away. I rarely show houses now because I know that my strength for my clients is behind the computer and negotiating for them. And I'm actively getting out of doing my consults for the most part. I'm still going to be in production, but for the most of my clientele, I won't be doing the consults either. And it's not that I don't love it anymore. It's just I have grown as a person and a professional. So my love has been in a different light now, right? And then drop your ego. Do you guys know what your ego can do to you in this business? Not my team, but here's what I see every day. Your ego will kill you in this business. And I say that on a weekly basis because we see it with cross agents. We've seen it with ourselves. Your ego will kill you in this industry. If you're walking out of here and you say, I didn't learn anything, that's your ego, right? You can learn no matter who is talking to you. I learn from my team just as much as they learn from me. So drop your ego and start to level up. Lean into those that bring you value. And then those who you surround yourself with can make or break your mindset. So like I said, I was burnt out. The one person I always said for years, I would never, ever be burnt out. I love this too much. And then I had to rebuild my team. And then I was 10 days postpartum, came back into full-blown work. And I started to resent the business. And my mindset was just so defeated. And then I came to co-founders and I met Chad Cooley and Michelle and my whole world changed, the energy. So what I mean with that is that was my first step was co-founders and changing. But then I realized I need to change everything in my world. And if somebody isn't part of my family, if I don't love something, if I'm not passionate about it, or it doesn't make me money, I'm not doing it. And that's how you should live your life. Surround yourself with people that make you happy, that drive you. If you're leaving a meeting or you're leaving something and you're like, I need to go take a nap. That was terrible, right? Maybe change the scenery a little bit. And that was my life. I would leave seminars and I'm like, okay, is it tequila time yet? It's like, I'm ready to be done. And then I come in this room and I see all of you guys screaming and the Jones Collective, like it's a lot over there and I was like I need to be around these people but it didn't stop there it was my partnerships NP Bruce has not been in our life very long 
That's a vibe as well. Our team dynamic, we grew and we're still growing, and we know that we won't bring anybody in that isn't a vibe. Now, it doesn't mean you have to be happy and energetic every day, but you have to be around people that you feel good around and that make you feel good. So these are your tips to hiring, and this is coming from the last couple years on when we failed miserably in my old team. Hire fast, fire fast. But what I mean by hire fast, not, don't skip steps. Don't just hire anybody that you find on the street next door, right? But make a decision and then commit to that, and then don't be scared to fire them. If they don't make it past the first 30 days, get rid of them. If you have questions after two weeks, not in are they going to learn it, in their values and what they bring to your business, get rid of them and don't apologize for it because this is a business at the end of the day and those people are going to touch your clientele and they're either going to make you look real good or they're going to not make you look good, right? And they're going to get you fired. Do not lawyer or hire me and Ryan are so bad at this. We would leave an interview and we'd be like, yeah, I don't know, but like she has this or he has that. I feel like maybe we should just do it because we were hiring out of pain, right? If you're ever lawyering why you should hire somebody, you should not hire them. Even if on paper they look great. I have turned away people that on paper I was like, man, this is a good hire. But something in my gut fell off and I listen to that feeling now every single time. So listen to your gut. Take the time to train. I hear agents all the time say, I don't have the time to train somebody. I'm running, right? If you don't have the time to train somebody, you need to train somebody. And you're going to waste a lot less time fixing their issues if you just train them up front. It's the same thing with your process and having a consultation, right? You take that time up front, you're going to fix a lot less issues down the road. If you take the time up front with your people, you're going to fix a lot less mistakes. Set ample expectations and uphold these expectations unapologetically. Something I used to do is I would go into interviews and I'd be like, yeah, work great, work hard, play hard, like it's so awesome, I'm like the most cool person, I don't even like care that much about things. And then they'd come in my office and they're like, this person's psycho, <laughs> why does she care this much, right? So in my interview process, I tell them, hey, I love people. I love hard, I'm so loyal, I'm so much of a trusting person. I am work hard, play hard, but what people don't understand is when it's time to work, if you can't snap that quick into work mode from play mode, you're not gonna work out well with us. I'm neurotic, I'm a little bit of a control freak, don't micromanage, but I'm a little controlling, and I have an extremely high standard of who touches my clients, and I tell them that up front. If they wince, I know that they're not a good fit for me. But if they're like, hell yeah, I care about people too. Like, let's do this. I want to be a grinder too. I'm like, yes, we need to talk to this person more. So be you. And my friend, Liz Johnson, she's the one that taught me that. Um, she's an amazing realtor. And she's not part of co-founders, but she's amazing. And she is a very much a straight shooter. And that was the best advice I ever got when it came to hiring. It's just be you, don't be fake. Because when they come into your office, they're going to be like, who is this person? You're either a liar or you're bipolar, right? What is it? <laughs> Oh. Inspect what you expect. You don't have to micromanage people. You shouldn't micromanage people. You should train them and then you should trust them to fly, but you have to inspect what you expect, right? And so even in our leadership, I expect what I expect from my leaders and I know that they're expecting, inspecting what they expect from all of their people. And so make sure that you guys do that every single week. I mean, even the best of the best, some people get complacent. I get complacent sometimes, right? You need to make sure that you're inspecting things. So this is our team dynamic. I had a lot of agents after our mastery class ask who, who is on our team. So me and Ryan are the only active agents right now on our team. And we've, uh, it was me only for a long time doing the numbers. Megan Berry, I already talked about her. She is our lead listing coordinator. So she only really does listings and transactions for, for our sellers. And then she does all of our ops and compliance stuff. So she's my ops queen, compliance queen. She is my right hand. She's my beating heart. And she's the one person on our team that is brave enough to be like, Amber, stop doing that. You're doing it wrong. This is not the standard of Rally Point Properties. And she's told me that before. And that's why she's so good at her job, because she cares about her brand. 
and she's extremely smart. She hates hugs. Uh, don't hug her if you like her. She gives me two hugs a year, and I've known her for four years. Reese Young, she's our transaction coordinator on the buying side. Um, and so she does all of our buyers, but then she also does all of our events, our social media, our client care, all of that kind of stuff. That's her niche. Um, and she just got her license two weeks ago and is actually following in my footsteps, another transaction coordinator that's about to go kill it in this industry as a realtor. She's actively bridging right now. She's fired y'all. Watch out for her name. And then Alexis Serrano, she's our showing agent. She loved us so much as a past client, she wanted to come work with us. So she knows our clientele, she knows how we do everything, and she is literally one of my limbs. So she shows all of our clients, for me at least. Ryan loves showing clients. He's a people person more than I am. But uh, Alexis shows all of our clients. She does all of the side recon for our clients. She's on our group tech, so if I'm in things like this, my whole team is making sure that our clients are not skipping a beat. And so I do group texts with everybody, whether they're on the showing side and then I can add my TC afterwards. And that's how we continue to make sure that I'm in it, but I'm not in it, right? And then they make sure that everything keeps working properly. And then Madison is our newest transaction coordinator. She's been filming everybody today. So she's taking Reese's place. So she's like fresh into the industry, but her goal in life is also to be a realtor. So I'm just gonna start making a bunch of little me's out there. <laughs> so last little part, you guys, the biggest thing that I learned in the last two years is not that family's first, because family's always first, but is I can't just delegate my business. When I got my license, I had another crossroads, right? Where I had to say, well, me and Ryan had been married for about five years, I think, and we wanted kids. And I said, well, now I'm gonna launch this team, and do I put kids on hold? How do I launch a team and do all of this to the quality that I want, because I'll never lower my quality, and have kids? And I said yes before my brain could tell me no. Right? Well, don't choose that, but, well, there's Deegan. So there's my four and a half year old. And then my little COVID surprise, Rowan, is two and a half. Uh, so we had two kids in the last four and a half years, and I've been pr I was pregnant, I mean, for multiple years at a time, all in the beginning of our, of our business. Now, where it really hit me hard, because I was one of those people that are like, everybody's telling me I can't have kids and do this volume. Well, what have you guys learned with me today, right? When somebody tells me I can't do something, I'm gonna do it. So I was the one, um, literally in labor, negotiating a 35R, um, right before I was pushing, just really because I was like, I'm gonna prove everybody wrong, I can do this, right? I didn't skip a beat with my first. With my, with my second, you know, that's when we separated from one of our business partners, we, we removed multiple people from our team, and I came back to work, and that's when it hit me really hard. I had really, really severe postpartum depression. If you guys are on my Instagram, you'll see a podcast that I just launched, very fresh, so there's only a couple episodes, but it talks about my journey there. Um, and I had to sit down and I said, I'm burnt, and I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'm not okay, I'm not mentally okay. How am I gonna be okay for my clients? But most importantly, how am I gonna be okay for these babies, right? And so instead of quitting, because even though at that time I was thinking about quitting, I'm not a quitter, right? You only truly fail if you quit. So you guys aren't quitters, that's why you're here. And so I sat down and when something's not working, get strategic. And if you can't figure it out, call me. I'll help you get strategic. I'm a master at just figuring out problems and creating solutions for them. And so what I did was I started to outsource my life, okay? So when you get to a point where you're like, I don't want to spend my whole weekend cleaning and doing laundry and doing my dishes every night and then I'm in bed at like 9 o'clock and I'm exhausted and I just want to watch trash TV and turn my brain off because I'm exhausted because all I do is clean and work and clean and work and then cry a little bit in there. Can anybody relate to that? <laughs> I don't really cry that much, I promise. But so what I did was I started to outsource. So I have a house manager now. Um, this is very fresh. It was about a year ago. I told Ryan, I was like, I can't do this anymore. Um, and I'm very prideful. And I felt like I could only be a good mom if I did everything, right? If, just like I felt in the beginning that I could only be a good realtor if I did everything. 
until somebody that I highly respected said that if you think that, that's your ego speaking. Anybody can do what you do, and that is true. It's a hard truth. I was mad that day. I was like, stop yelling at me, right? But it's a, it's a hard truth, and so I put myself back in that mindset, and I was at my list, and I said, maybe you don't have to do it everything. And really it was Ryan saying, why do you feel like you have to do every piece of laundry, every piece of dishes? Why do you have to clean? Why do you have to do all this? And we do it together, but I would get mad if I'm not the one feeling like I'm doing all this and doing the snacks and doing the dinner, right? And I had my identity around that. And then I checked myself and I said, that's your ego. You don't have to do this. So I hired a house manager. And if you guys want my list of what I delegate to my house manager, she comes into my house three times per week. And while I'm at work, she's doing my dishes. She's doing my laundry. I really don't have to pay her very much. I pay her about 20 bucks an hour, three hours a day, three days a week. Probably spend more on Starbucks or DoorDash than that. And so a lot of people will say, Amber, that must be so nice that you have a house manager. But it's not. I don't go to Starbucks anymore. We don't do DoorDash. One DoorDash, one Instacart, you're paying exactly what I pay to not have to do laundry, not do dishes. She literally resets my entire house because I'm OCD as well. Um, and so I need everything as a stager, right, and a listing agent. I'm like, I want everything always to be perfect, but I have toddlers. And so when I walk in, it's perfect. The beds are made, everything's done. Everything that my OCD needs is done. She does organizational projects. And we have had high turnover with this, but I have a bulletproof system to where I can hire anybody. I have videos on where everything goes. And then I get to spend the time with my husband, with my kids. Me and Ryan have date day every single Saturday, unless we're working. We're either working or we have date day because we have a mid-morning babysitter every Saturday on call. And why we do that is because my kids need us to be healthy. We need us to be healthy. And we're in an industry where the divorce rate is through the freaking roof, right? And so for me, I'm like, I don't want to be a statistic and I find myself losing myself in this business. So don't lose yourself in the business. Figure out what you can afford. Figure out what you can sacrifice and do what you love and recharge. And that's the balance. It's not doing just personal stuff, right? It's we work really hard and we're very specific on where we want to spend the rest of our time. So how to figure that out. doesn't come up, can you just kind of tell you guys? No. <laughs> Awkward. So I'll start talking and then you'll have it up here, but if it doesn't come up, I'll send you guys this. So and you write this down, so get your notes ready. So how you figure out how you can do it and if it makes sense for you. Because again, you know, six years ago, I, I did so much, right? This was evolving and breaking through ceilings. And with a business model like mine, you're gonna see a lot of glass ceilings. I felt six glass ceilings in my third year of real estate. I would break through a ceiling and I'd have another one. I'd break through a ceiling and I'd have another one. And I would just be so exhausted from all the ceilings I was breaking through. So it happens really fast when you have a referral-based business. And so how you figure out what you're ready for is it's all math, right? And I hate math, but I love numbers. I'm a very much so numbers and fact-based person. I'm not going to lie to myself and say, oh, yeah, I can totally afford all of this. It's great. And then I'm in debt, right? Um, and so and we're debt-free now. So stay debt-free. Don't put yourself into debt. You don't need it that much, right? Figure it out. And if you guys ever want um, our story and our financial journey, you can always call me. And I'm like an uber nerd with all of that. Um, but number one is write down your overall GCI. If you don't know it, Look at your PL. If you're saying I don't have a PL, get a PL, like right now. Um, and then before I go to the step two, does anybody here take a percentage out of every check that they get and put it into a tax savings account? Hell yes. Yes. And did you see how little the hands went up? Take 30%. I take 30% because I like to have extra after the IRS. Like it takes everything from me. Um, but I take 30% of every check I get and it's not mine. My girls tell me exactly what I need to transfer to this account and I don't touch it. Um, and I put it into an account and then I pay my quarterly taxes because you will cry. I have seen grown men and women cry because they spent their tax money and then the IRS is coming after them and you don't have it. Don't spend your money that's not yours. Take 30% out. We always have extra at the end. And then we'll use that to take a vacation 
or for us, we've, we've purchased three properties since we started. And so for us, for the last six years, we were putting that towards our next property. How do we get our next property? And so invest it, but also have fun, right? Enjoy, take a vacation. And then it doesn't feel as gross when you're just like, okay, I just wrote this huge check and I had to like steal it from here. Now I'm in debt somewhere else, right? So do that. And then, um, so back to here, number two, divide that number. So your GCI, you're gonna divide that by the number of weeks per year you work. And so, I know this is kind of blurry, but I use the $150,000 as an example. So you're gonna divide that by 48 weeks, that's giving you a month off. So you don't wanna pretend and lie to yourself that you're gonna work every single day of the year. You're not going to. So be realistic. And then you're gonna divide that number by the average hours that you work per week and also be realistic with this. So if you only work 20 hours, cool. Only, only put 20 hours, because you're only telling yourself this, right? I put uh, 40 hours for me um, because I'm a workaholic. I work like 50 to 60 because we're building right now, but figure out what that number is. And then you're going to uh, divide that by the number of hours, and then uh, this is your hourly rate. So with this example, you make $70 per hour. So anything that costs less than that, I'm going to outsource. And what I did in the beginning before I had my kids and I went through all of that in my journey, and how I, I did this with my professional cleaner, right? I was like, okay, well, I need to get a professional cleaner because I have that on top of my house manager. She does all the deep cleaning. She cost me $180 an hour. This is my hourly. Okay, well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have her come clean and I'm gonna lead gen. And when I get a lead from my lead genning, I just paid for the whole damn year. And that's what I did for three years. Anything I outsourced, I worked while they worked to make it make sense. Now. I spend time with my kids, I recharge, I balance myself out to make sure that I can pull myself away because I love what I do so much, it's hard for me not to work because I love it. And so um, use this, we'll have this on that uh, Google Drive as well. Um, and then just know that you're going to continue to evolve and so just keep this in mind and know that you don't have to do it all. Truly, you're not a worse person because you don't do everything. People come into my house and it's sparkling and my kids are like great and they're like, her and my best friend, she's like, your house looks awesome. I'm like, yeah, my house manager just left. And she's like, oh, I feel so much better about my life, right? So just know that when you're seeing things on social media and everybody has this perfect life, there it's not perfect. So you don't have to do everything. Just figure out how to do it all without actually doing it all. And that's it. Yeah! Thanks for watching. I hope you learned a lot from that. I know I did. We have these meetings every Tuesday where we learn from top producers in our industry. And if you want to be a part of these meetings, whether it's live or on Zoom, DM me on Instagram at Mr. Aaron Yoon. We can bring you in. Also, if you're interested in taking one to five new extra listings every month, we have the Breakfast Club training designed to help you do exactly that. I made a video about it. I'll post it somewhere on the screen. You can check it out. If you want to be in there live with us every morning, again, DM me on Instagram, Mr. Aaron Yoon. We can bring you on the Breakfast Club as well if it's a fit. If you made it to this point, you know you're my favorite person in the world and I want to know who you are. So if you made it to this point, comment down below. Michelle's pants looked very good today. The leather pants? <laughs> the tight leather? <laughs> comment down below. Michelle's pants looked great. And I'll know who made it to this point. Thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you in the next one.